I mean, you did not have a typical career path to be the CEO of Ford. I mean, tell us a little bit about how you view your, your journey here. Well, uh, I want to start with there's a prominent color in my history. I'll let you guess what it is. <laughs> blue? It's blue. <laughs> So, you know, when I started out of, uh, at Michigan, you know, of course, the blue, the maize and blue, but the blue in Michigan, I go to Procter & Gamble. Uh, little known that uh, I was three years behind Dave Brandon, who went to Procter & Gamble from Michigan, and we both had the same boss who, uh, you know, who kind of developed both of us out of uh, college. And I enjoyed that job immensely. My wife, who I was married to still today, 41 years later, uh, took, a work at, uh, took a job at Steelcase when I was at Procter & Gamble. So that's how I get introduced to Steelcase. And, uh, and the career at Steelcase is, well, Kathy and I, my wife, were just talking about this. It's, and some of you that have had long careers and then do something else, it's, it's, it's just a spectacular moment in my life. Mm -hmm. I learned so many things. And there are the kinds of things that carry forward. Like, I'll just give you one. Uh, it was in the New York Times, so I want to repeat it because I want to give credit to Mr. Pugh, Bob Pugh, who's passed on, said to me that leadership is a function of trust. So you're going to be a good leader if someone trusts you, and trust is the product of integrity. So when he was saying this to me, I thought, this is like three weeks as the CEO, I thought, oh my goodness, I've done something wrong. You know, what does he know? You know, but he wasn't. <laughs> he was just paying it forward because I was only three weeks in the job. And he said, the cost of, of the, the integrity going bad isn't that, you know, you'll get caught in a lie. It's that no one will want to follow you. And, uh, and so I think about things like that as I'm now in a world which is, you know, I was just in Russia and, and uh, working there with the government on some things. And... And so I just remember those kinds of features. Um, when uh, that career ended, and it was, you know, the, the way those kinds of things happened, I had been in the, the CEO almost 20 years, and I thought uh, that, as, as uh, the coach of the Bulls said, uh, uh, Phil Jackson, that the team might not listen to him anymore after he won some championships. That wasn't the case, but I was afraid that, you know, I would wear out in terms of being effective. And I really tried to remake myself, but it was time. And, uh, and so I was off thinking about different things, and I got a call from Mark Schlissel. And, and Mark and I hadn't met yet, but he was so com you know, uh, compelling in terms of this assignment to come back and help at U of M. What I told him the other day, that the reason I took the job wasn't because I was an ex-football player, it was I got to work next to a scientist. You know, Mark's a scholar at a very high level, and, and I have such interests because my father was a veterinarian and an inventor really in medicine, and I wanted to be around people who thought about new things that weren't where I came from, you know, in the, in the case of furniture and stuff like that. So I, I got to sit in the executive uh, table at Michigan and watch a university work, which was really wonderful. and you know, find Jim Harbaugh along the way. So, um, uh, but the departure from that, and it's quick, is in that time, Tony Early had asked me if I wanted to be on the Ford board, and I jumped at that, because Bill Ford and I have known each other for a long time in this setting, you know, the East and West, as we used to call it. I admired him from afar because uh, Bill McDonough, as an eco-architect, was working on the Rouge, uh, after they had an accident, industrial accident, to reconceptualize it. Mm -hmm. And he was working in Grand Rapids for us on, on the nature of synthetic fabrics that could uh, decay naturally. It was a really kind of difficult problem so that landfills wouldn't be populated with a lot of stuff that wouldn't, wouldn't go away. And I watched Bill get beat up by taking this position and he became a hero of mine. I mean, from a distance, I know what it's like to lead a company into un uncomfortable space. And so I you know, always admired him. And then I met Ted in 2011. I, I've gone for 30 years. And Bill's there giving a speech about the future of mobility, which is a seminal point because mobility is all over the place now in southeast Michigan. But he was the guy mm -hmm. 
who was yes, advancing was. it. And in fact, the environmental position ended up being a really important platform in the auto industry. My goodness, how important is that? The mobility is even bigger. And because of the strangulation around innovation everywhere, he started his own investment firm in parallel called Fontanellis here in Detroit. And so he, you know, I knew from him about what he was working on. And so when I went in the boardroom, we just spent lots of time talking about the future, which those who know me realize I love that. And it was just an intersection of being in Palo Alto with him one day, and he said, you know, uh, I need some help in a couple areas. So a year ago, more than a year ago, I stepped off the board to be chairman of uh, Smart Mobility for Ford. And really the, the, the deal I made with him was I don't want to run it. You know, I ran a company. If I wanted to be a CEO, I'd just stay at Steelcase. So he said, okay, well, you can be chairman. You know, it's like two guys just making <laughs> up names, you know. And, and so a year into it, we, we built a team. Uh, this thing presented itself unexpectedly. You know, this wasn't something I was after or, I'd, or I don't think Bill thought, you know, in a, it was not premeditated in any way. Uh, and we, we wrestled over it, you know, because when you're 62 and you're going to put the traveling boots back on and all that kind of stuff, I really had to think about it. But I can tell you today, I'm so happy I did it. Uh, uh, the issues and the opportunities we have and the people that I get to work with, starting with him, uh, I said to him, if, if I'm going to do this, I want to be a, a partner with you because I need somebody to talk to. I mean, I had that in the steel case relationship with Bob Pugh. It was just in these familial businesses is one of the big advantages. So we talk two or three times a day, mainly teasing each other a lot, but, but we're working on the future. And, uh, and so I'm really, really excited to, to share a little bit of that with you. You mentioned the word trust. So when we talk about this new mobility world, world though, Jim, there's a lot of ethical and even moral issues that we're going to face, but you've said you want to have Ford be the most trusted mobility company. What, talk a little bit more about what you mean. Well, it, 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 and the, the paradox is, and I always embarrass audiences, I won't do it here, I'll say who wouldn't get in an autonomous vehicle today, you know, and I'll get a show of hands. I would hint men, the women will tell the truth and you'll lie, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and that, and that the women are really authentic about that. Um, I think about uh, a woman being in a, a robotic vehicle and they're worried about getting out. That will be, that's solvable, right? But some people don't get on airplanes today because they don't know how to get out because they're up, you know, high in altitude. Um, so we have to build the trust that these things uh, will serve your needs in ways that you love it is an advantage that, uh, that uh, I'm hoping to instill in the company about understanding human use. It's, it's called user-centered or design thinking. And it's, it's a lot harder to explain in two minutes than, than it, than it uh, exhibits. But the promise of it is the third stop, uh, stop in that technology graphic. The promise of user-centered design is that you're making the technology labor on your be behalf. So as we work to create trust in these vehicles that you haven't seen yet, uh, we believe that the evolution of it will be the way the computer was. And so the first computers came out, if I showed you a picture of the Altair box that Steve, or I mean, uh, uh, not Steve Ballmer, but Bill Gates and Paul Allen programmed. There were no keyboards, there were these binary switches. And I hold my iPhone to it and I go, what happened in that, that generation? It's not just the power of the computing, because the computer science was built on von Neumann's binary language in both of them. It's the, the humanist at this hand, Jobs, interpreted the computer science for the way humans would love to use it. In fact, I miss him in, in the way he kept pushing that, because I have things in my cell phone now that I wish I think he would be addressing. We're trying to say that at Ford, so if I, if I put Below that, the first jelly bean autonomous vehicles that look like they have antlers on them. And I say, that's the version of the Altair. You've got to, you've, then you've got to say, what's the equation over here? What's the human version of the robotic vehicle? And that's what Ford wants to build. 
in addition to the word trust, you talk about smart vehicles, smart world. What does that mean? Well, there's a deeper discussion which I'll try and short, shorten, which is in my journey as an executive, trying to find ways when, when I had to lay off so many people at Steelcase, I went to see Dr. Tomatis, who's a famous heart surgeon in Grand Rapids and works with the DeVos family, and I would say uh, just a wonderful philosopher. And I said, Luis, I'm suffering over the way I was raised and the religion, the Catholic religion I'm fond of, which is these people are suffering because I'm making decisions, you know, to, um, to let them go. But it's, and he said, very smartly, he said, Do me, think of it this way. You got to get the business as fit as it is. So that's the, the time that I start to read about fitness, fitness in the physics sense. And then he said, socially, you can't just leave those people. So we created these parallel programs as they lost their jobs to help them rebound. Everybody got a job in the company. We, we, we kept it, uh, we traced it. We spent more on their exit than you normally would. Shareholders weren't real happy, but you know, your conscience was. Well, in that short circuit about fitness, what I learned is that one system gives way to another system over time because the virtues in the first system don't play in that next generation. So the Pony Express is the example that we're often using, railroad, U.S. post office, uh, oh, Claire brought the slide, go ahead and put those up, and um, the railroad, the post office, uh, FedEx, email, and Snapchat. Each of these are evolving over the same model that the Pony Express was was intended to do, had great virtue. But imagine the board meeting when I go in, CEO of Pony Express, and say, got this great idea. We're gonna get rid of the pony. Uh, it wouldn't have gone over very well. But the scientists who study this say that's the cycle of disruption, which is the virtue that's holding your advantage may go away. So Ford's future is not about giving up the car. I'm here to tell you that, I've told the company that, but there's no dumb cars in the future. There can't be dumb. And we know that uh, pretty clearly. So we have to evolve these things to be ever smarter. And, and so the nature of smartness, I hinted to you, is so much f deeper and richer than we ever expected. And in the last five years, there's a lot of innovations that we never thought about. Deep learning is one of them that are gonna make these things really smart. But an autonomous vehicle as it approaches a hill, think of the LIDAR as a form of, of light in a beam, it can't see over the hill because it's pointing up that way. So it has to guess. Now you can't see either over a hill, but your brain is wired in a way that either the pattern of going over hills tells you something, or you've been over that hill before, or there's, there's a negative thing where something's in the other lane coming at you. So what we believe to make them super safe is the hill needs to communicate to you. What's on the other side needs to tell you. And, and here's the thing about technology, it can do that. It's called edge computing. Uh, edge computing is a very low cost. Uh, Internet of Things is another way of you've seen it. It's about delegating uh, computing to really st stupid things and having them connect. So a friend of mine, Danny Hillis, who's a father of parallel processing, a really bright guy, tells this story. Imagine that you're a Martian and you come and you're riding with Jim Hackett in a Mustang right now. And I say, this thing, I'm taking him on the test track, we can hit 140 miles an hour. And I say to him, and you know what's really challenging is when the car comes at me the other way. But don't worry, Martian, we have a yellow line painted between the two cars. <laughs> So that tells you the challenge of the smart vehicle, smart environment, is the environment needs to take a responsibility for the protection. And the technology is upon us to do that. And so M City, the Willow Run initiative that the governor started, both are about the in intersection of the vehicle and the environments. And for the early work, we were just putting children mannequins, you know, so the car can recognize them. But you should know the next gen of this is we're gonna put edge computing in those spaces and then start to author something that Doug 
uh, challenged me in the 25 years is what can Southeast Michigan own? You can own the transportation operating system. That, that smart environment can be ours. It's, it's not really advanced anywhere in the world to the place where it can't be ours. And I'd like to appeal to you that say there's lots of opportunity. Some people think, and I'm not making this number up, this $11 trillion. And the way you gotta think of how could it be that big, it's because of how dumb the stop signs and the painted lines and everything are. It's what would replace it. People describe you as being a change agent. Do you, do you feel that that's your role at Ford? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the humble part of this, if you've run a company for 20 years, you realize you can't do a darn thing unless you have a great group of people. And I work hard to hire and be around and sit with much smarter people than myself. In fact, if anything, the family that I started telling you about, uh, I had three older brothers and it was very competitive at the table, physically and intellectually. So I had two brothers in the Ivy League and I was the last and all three of them had been number one in their class in high school. And, and so what, what I witness is that if, if I could be around smart people like my brothers, I could be pretty good. And so uh, what I'm trying to do is make it okay for Ford to say this to itself. We're not know-it-alls, we can be learn-it-alls. And we can learn from everybody in the world and it doesn't make you less of a capable person. I love you just as much. But because we can learn from everybody, now we have the power of that in the way we configure our, our answers for the market.